Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. All right, we've attempted too many openings. I'm not even going to try. This is what we're going with. Yeah, this is it. Right totally now. ad hoc, off the cuff. This is what people pay the, their good, good hard-earned money for. That's right. That's right. Just uh, we were just chatting about um, seagulls. What, actually, yes. <laughs> Where do they live? Uh, we were just talking about it with Winged Wheel Podcast Nights. There's always something that happens where we have to essentially like recreate the wheel to uh to make it all work and uh this time was every time we are more prepared and, and from our side from the red wing side we we know how this goes better and better each and every time and uh then abc flexes a game from the 7 p.m eastern to the 1 p.m eastern and and it's okay we have contingency plans for all this we're working with the team to finalize those and we'll announce it but it's just like you know it was naive of us to think that this whole thing this was the time that it was going to work we definitely have a lot more dues to be paid I did not, you know, when you think of all the things that could possibly go wrong or change on you, I never thought about the game time changing. <laughs> it's always a liability in sports, especially that late in the season as they look to, like, emphasize playoff matchups. It, it, you understand why it happens. I no, still I think... don't. I'm a Red Wings fan. I don't understand. <laughs> playoff matchups? What are you talking about? Oh, <laughs> what are those? This is premier Winged Wheel podcast, folks. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, here to talk to you about all things Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and a very special interview with Elmer Soderblom this episode. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Uh, in this episode of the show, we are going to recap the Red Wings win, their exciting OT win over the San Jose Sharks last night. Uh, we'll get into our conversation with Detroit Red Wings and Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids Griffins. I'm not even editing that. Everyone's That's just fine. Gonna, everyone's just going to live with how and like off base we are this episode uh red wings and griffins uh forward and resident michigan behemoth uh elmer soderblom uh really really happy to have him on the show and uh another player who we've had on the podcast so nice little uh uh, pillar for us uh we are going to talk about the ever expanding uh rumor mill around the trade deadline and detroit's involvement in the bo horvat race uh, and whatever other NHL news comes up. Before all that, Winged Wheel Podcast Night, or I guess now Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA. Uh, it's an event that we have run three times previous in partnership with the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, it involves a uh, live recording of the Winged Wheel Podcast uh, at Hockey Town Cafe. Previous ones have uh, had Ken Daniels and Mickey Redmond. Uh, we have more surprises in store for you in terms of... Uh, uh, things to give away, people you might see. Uh, we're working on it, and, and we kind of want to save it, but uh, uh, we're working to make each and every one better. So there's a live podcast, there's a Q&A, there's a meet and greet, more importantly with the special guests, but uh, also if you're interested for whatever reason, us the hosts, there's merch, there's prizes, there's giveaways, uh, food and drinks available for you to buy, um, and it's a really, really great time. And also your tickets get you access to the Detroit Red Wings game. So Saturday, April 8th, uh, now at 1 p.m., that's against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, you get uh, a discounted ticket. It's a special Winged Wheel podcast discount, and uh, you sit in special Winged Wheel podcast sections. So we have the entire gondola booked out. So if you ever want to watch a game with the same view that Ken and Mick have, uh, the gondola, uh, those seats give you that great view, and also upper and lower bowl seats uh, available. Uh, and I am just checking now, and the gondola is completely sold out to give you an idea of how fast these tickets go. So, and most importantly, a portion of the proceeds benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So big thanks to our partners at the Detroit Red Wings. DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. Link is in the description of this episode. If you want to get your tickets, do it soon. San Jose Sharks came to town. And we all marveled at what is going on with Eric Carlson's career path because that guy is legitimately good. Like I told you before the episode, my biggest struggle on a week-to-week basis is not spending half an episode trying to rationalize and figure out a way to get Eric Carlson in Detroit. Evan, just pay his salary, man. We know you can afford it. No problem. Salary cap's not real. We can make this work, yeah? Yeah. All of a sudden, I am no longer in favor of the salary cap. Yeah. um, This is the craziest, like post 30 career resurgence like it's one thing when a player bounces back in his 30s he's gonna win a norris 
at 32 after having two to three like down injury riddled years. Being near the top of the this is the worst contract in the NHL list for in that time. And justifiably so. Like he looked bad at points. A lot of it has to do with um you know getting healthy and a lot of it has to do with his role changing now that Brent Burns left the team, right? Oh yeah, well that just comes with a bigger opportunity, more ice time. You know, I I'll, I'll always argue the point he was always better than Brent Burns, so it made no sense to me when he was on power play too, but Brent Burns is a very good player, so you have to divvy up the ice time and yeah, numbers and whatever go down because of that. Anyhow, uh, the Red Wings took on the Sharks. They came into town. Uh, it was the Red Wings' last home game before the All-Star break. Uh, no one else other than Big Earn opened scoring uh, off of a Larkin shot, and that was point number 400 for Dylan Larkin. Time really does fly, doesn't it? I remember his rookie, like his first games, his rookie year, us like advocating like, yeah, Larkin is, you know, stick on this team and he has a future as a star and, and what a steal. Like it looks like a top five player out of his draft. 400 points already? It's insane. We are just a couple weeks away from eight years of this podcast. You want to know what? Actually, I forgot to tell you this. Uh, we passed our 600th episode. Completely missed that milestone. That's on you. I know, which is why we're going to miss every milestone. Next week, we're going to pass 1,000 episodes, I'm sure, and I'm just going to miss that too. Uh, anyways, yeah, Dylan Larkin, 400 career points. Um, great accomplishment. Great highlight as to what he's done for this team, especially on a team that has been incredibly unproductive scoring wise over pretty much Larkin's entire career here. Uh, really cool. Also, before we, I, I forget this, this is another win with their reverse retro jerseys. Nice little streak with those. Uh, the Red Wings um, ended up winning the game 3 2. Meyer tied it after Ernie scored. Uh, Michael Rasmussen with a great effort on his goal. Got decked at the blue line, got up, picked up the puck in the slot, and fired it home. And then uh, the Red Wings did their usual thing of letting in a late period goal that was completely avoidable. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube and you're wondering why, in the middle of a sentence, uh, we're all of a sudden smiling, uh, there's an incredible blooper. Uh, Patrons, I I had to cut it, but I'm going to make it available for our patrons. Um, (laughs) Anyhow, the, the Sharks tied uh, the game late after all of the Red Wings on the ice got caught for way too long of a shift uh, which culminated in an Adam Ernie giveaway Uh, he could have cleared the puck didn't and uh, the puck went in the net so tradition as always for the Red Wings no goals in the third period and then Andrew Kopp uh, buries the effort from Michael Rasmussen originally in front and the Red Wings end up winning the game in overtime I didn't know they were allowed to do that it hasn't been too long. They lost. What they lost a shootout against um, the Coyotes. They, who they just think about that statement. Ryan. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know they beat the Penguins on the twenty eighth in, in OT. Yeah, that was the. Uh, yeah, now they're what two and five in oh, extra time. Well, let's not get into all the details because they lost to Washington. They lost to Dallas. What other OT games do they have? They lost to Buffalo. They beat Arizona. So hey. One and one, they lost to Anaheim, <laughs> they lost to Montreal, they beat New York. Anyhow, uh, so the Red Wings get the home win. Uh, nice to see Cop get his goal. Um, Cop's season has been up and down, I think. I think slow start. The news came out that uh, the core surgery obviously was a little bit more serious than people, what people thought. Uh, he was kind of getting up to speed, and I think that process is still happening. Like He's a little bit uh, more up to speed every game, but it doesn't really seem to be a linear process. So anytime you can see him have a good game where he's skating well and can and can generate some production, it's nice to see. Yeah, and he's the type of player, too, who gets exponentially better the better his line mates are because he's such a sound, well-rounded player that he can play off of more talented players and 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 kind of raise up to their level, which is confusing why he signed in Detroit then. But <laughs> um, it, it's nice when when everything comes together for him. Forty six point pace, it, like for a down year, not terrible. You certainly hope that he trends a little back up for a little while. Again, if he's playing with sound line mates for the entire year and with any consistency and without an injury, I I would think he'd be good for five to ten more points at least. Uh, how about that cider poke check and then immediate hit in open ice against Eric Carlson? He took some off that hit, right? 
Um, yeah, it it wasn't Carlson wasn't skating super fast because Carlson really slowed down to uh, undress the two Red Wings that were chasing him uh, before running into the third one. But no, I I don't think either of them were moving super fast, and that was about how it was going to go based on the speed. But literally, the textbook this is how you can deliver a hit in the neutral zone without getting burned if it goes poorly because by the time cider got shoulder to chest the puck had already been knocked off carlson's stick by cider yeah it was uh cider has looked we were actually talking about this in the group chat today cider has looked consistently better like consistently more himself you know i don't think there was a lot of cause for long-term concern uh when you saw cider kind of off his game at the start of the year uh but when it it comes to you know playing what we saw more of last season a little bit more consistently that's that's what we've been seeing and i thought last night or actually maybe not even so much last night because you know they got burned on that that shift where they were out there for too long but uh, his game he looks a lot more like himself he's doing a lot more of what made his game uh you know flashy of course but also like the stops at the blue line the the anticipatory plays where he breaks up a rush or whatever it might be that is is coming out of the woodwork a little bit more. So we know the most cider of old, which is stupid to say he's in a second season. Uh, but it's here, and it's um, it's comforting for Red Wings fans. It certainly looks more um, decisive and confident with the puck as opposed to earlier in the season, too. You know, that might be, you know, consistent line mates or predictable line mates or, you know, he's just kind of shrugged off the, the sophomore slump. Talented um, line mate. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> echo, but, echo. Yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, he's looked excellent for the past, basically for this calendar year. Since he's been with Walman. Yeah. You can say it, Evan. It's fine. Uh, the Red Wings' upcoming games, uh, they have two more before the All-Star break, both on the road. They have Montreal on Thursday night and then in New York or in Long Island against the Islanders on Friday night. And then no games until February 7th at home against Edmonton. So all-star break where that's only really a problem for Dylan Larkin. Sorry, Dylan, once again. If you want that contract, you're going to have to be an all-star, and you've succeeded in that part. So everyone, gonna, That's why the contract negotiation has stalled, because he's trying to get a clause in there that says he doesn't have to go to all-star games anymore. Look, the, if Nick Litstrom and Pavel Datsuk couldn't get that clause, I'm sorry, Dylan. Uh, Dylan is, unfortunately, as long as he's playing like he is, he's going to have to go. Uh, okay. The uh, that's the upcoming schedule. Let's get to the good part of this episode. Our conversation with uh, Detroit Red Wings uh, giant Elmer Soderblom. He was very gracious with his time, and we were really excited to have him on the show. Uh, talked about his him bursting onto the scene, uh, what it's like to drive in Michigan, what it's like to play against his brother, uh, adjusting to life in North America, and uh, lots more. So, without further ado, enjoy this interview with Elmer Soderblom. Records are meant to be broken, uh, but this one might not be for a long time. Probably our tallest uh, Winged Wheel podcast guest star ever. Uh, welcome to the show for the first time, Detroit Red Wings and Grand Rapids Griffins player Elmer Soderblom. Elmer, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks so much for having me. I have to open with this, and I know you get asked this a million times, so I apologize in advance. Soderblom? Soderblom? What's the best way to say it? I actually don't care, but what I've heard the most is like Soderblom. I think okay. I've heard the most. So, yeah, I'll just go with that. Perfect. We have a a big contingent of Swedish listeners, and they get honest about it. So as long as you okay. approve it, we're good to go. Yeah, for me, it doesn't matter. So, Elmer, this has been an incredibly uh, uh, surprising and, and really great season for you. Obviously, you, you made the team right out of camp, which was um, a pleasant surprise for everyone. Uh, what was that like for you? When you came into camp, did you think that you had an opportunity to really make the Red Wings, or did you expect that it was going to be Red Wings training camp and then off to Grand Rapids? Yeah, so like I didn't know what to expect when I first got there. But, of course, my my goal was to, to take a spot on the roster, so that was what I was aiming for. But I didn't know how, like, how big that chance was. So, yeah, of course, I was really happy when I when I made the team. And obviously have to ask you about that first game of the season. You scored the first goal of the Red Wings 22-23 season. Uh, it was the game winner against Montreal. The entire crowd went absolutely ballistic. Uh, what was that feeling like for you? 
yeah, it was just uh, an unbelievable feeling, of course. Uh, that's what you dream about to score, to score first NHL goal. So, yeah, it was just a really cool feeling. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to re- remember that for a long time. What kind of uh, what kind of advice were other guys giving you before your first game? Like, um, like you know, uh, just uh, enjoy it and uh, you know play play my game and uh, just have fun out there. I think that's the most important thing. Just relax and play your game. So going back to 2019, uh, the Red Wings took you in the sixth round, 159th overall. And uh, it was an interesting moment for Red Wings fans because they caught wind of this this guy who was, I believe, you're six six at the time, and you've grown since then. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. So relatable, of course. Uh, and you were this big guy who could drive the net, but had dangles, silky hands, like someone who is a foot shorter than you. Uh, were you surprised to have been drafted by the Red Wings? Were you expecting to be drafted that day at all? And and what was that whole experience like? Uh, yeah. I didn't really know what to expect there because I had I talked to some other teams, but uh, yeah, I was just uh, really happy to to get drafted that day. Uh, I was just sitting with my family and wa- watching the draft. Uh, so yeah, super exciting to be drafted by by the Red Wings. So uh, yeah, I was super happy that day. Who was the uh, first person from the Red Wings that reached out after drafting you and? Um... What did they say? When did they start to, you know, game plan for you? What their expectations were? Like the first guy to reach out was a scout, uh, Hakan uh, Anderson. So, yeah, he just called me and uh, told me about the development camp coming up. And, uh, yeah, we just just got ready to to fly over to Detroit right away and uh, participate in the development camp. And... uh, yeah, so that was just a real fun experience. Coming through the Red Wing system, which has been prolific for developing some of the greatest Swedes to ever play in the NHL, and then obviously other Swedes uh, uh, in the same development pipeline as you, notably Lucas Raymond, what was it like to have that connection to the Red Wings and to obviously your teammate now in Lucas? Yeah, of course. It's it's really fun to have to have a lot of, of Swedes in the organization. Uh even and the prospects coming up now also and yeah me and lucas have, has been playing with each other for a long time so yeah it's 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 really nice to have that kind of kind of like connection the chemistry with the uh, swedish guys here yeah i'm sure it helps make the transition from north america or from europe to north america a little bit easier as well yeah for sure that's like uh, it's easier to as you said to move over and uh you know, the first year here, it's, it's always nice to have a lot of Swedes, Swedes here. Speaking of that transition, obviously making the team uh, at a camp, uh, there must have been some kind of support from the guys in the room. Were there any of the veterans in the room who really kind of helped you out or uh, or the guys that uh, the rookies really look up to? Uh, yeah, of course, there's plenty of them. Uh, you know, a guy like David Perron, obviously, has a lot of experience and been in the league for a long time. And then, yeah, I feel like it's a pretty tight group. So I think uh, everybody's really good at uh, yeah taking care of each other and uh, just be a really tight group. You know, we were talking before the show and uh, we noticed that it was about two years ago around this time where you scored two between the leg goals in front of the net at the World Juniors for Sweden. Uh, are we going to see a tweener goal in the NHL sometime? Is that something that you're looking to do? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll see if, <laughs> if it happens. It happens. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe if I get the chance, I will try it again, and maybe it works. I will see. And I wanted to a- ask you, Elmer, about um, you know playing in Forlunda growing up. Like, did you? play in for Lunda because that was your hometown like how did that work did your dad sway you because he was the athletic trainer there like how did how does that all work like how do you pick where you're going to what organization you're going to be part of uh in the junior yeah. hockey ranks yeah so uh i started off in a club called uh Huvos, Huvos, yeah. uh so that's a little smaller team uh, and i played there until i was maybe 12 years old and then i Switched to Frölunda uh, to play a couple of years in the junior 
program and then uh yeah when i started uh you know college kind of thing uh, with combining it with school also and yeah it's a really good program there in Frölunda so it was it was an easy choice to go over there and uh, i think it's uh yeah it was a really good decision was um was your your dream to always just play for the hometown team in the SHL or or when did aspirations of the NHL start to become more of a reality for you? Yeah, I think uh, to play in the NHL has always been like the main goal or like the big goal in the in my career. So, yeah, but before that, I was my goal was obviously to play for for London for the for the A team there, and uh, yeah, you know, just having like small small goals and small steps to to take you to to where you want to be so yeah i think um i think the timing for Lunda was uh was really good elmer your skill set basically you your package as a player has been described uh, as a unicorn in that you're uh, a big body on the ice uh, can use that to protect the puck but again like we mentioned before you have handles and dangles like someone who is uh, much closer to the ice so to speak uh, have you always had uh, that kind of emphasis on your your stick work and your puck handling, or was that something that you really focused on over time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I always liked to to stick handle ever since I was a little kid growing up. So yeah, I really liked that a lot and practiced it off ice also. So, but yeah, I put a lot of time in it. So it's. Uh, yeah, it feels good to to be able to to move pretty well, even though I'm pretty big. So, yeah, I think that's that's a good uh, part of my game. So, uh, obviously, the the season got off to a great start for you, and as things settled in, uh, it's a long season. Uh, the NHL game is physical. Uh, was there any aspect of the NHL game that you found uh, you really had to focus on, or uh, you really had to grind through and improve to to stay in the NHL roster? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a little bit of uh, different things. You know, f- the physicality is one thing, and also uh, like the pace. It's faster. You have to make your decision faster, and uh, you know, make the right decisions in a higher le- speed. So, I think that's uh, that was the biggest difference. I think. And uh, obviously you've had, uh, five, I think, five games now with the Griffins. Uh, the Red Wings have had a roster squeeze this year, something that's pretty new for Red Wings fans. Uh, when you got sent down, was there uh, anything that the Red Wings, either coaching staff or management, uh, asked you to focus on? Uh, any aspects of your game that they asked you to work on with the, in your time down in the AHL? Uh, yeah, they want me to uh, just play more minutes and, you know, make make better decisions and keep being stronger on the puck and improving the puck protection and uh, the give and go, you know, find passes and find a new spot, move, move my feet. And uh, yeah, just basically improve as a player and uh, take step and to be a better player and be able to play full time in the NHL. Now this is, I think your first time living in North America. Has there been anything that's, surprised you with the north american lifestyle um it's it's different things i think it's a lot of different things you know obviously the the food is different here compared compared to sweden and like also the traffic is a little bit you know driving here feels a bit different than driving back in sweden and uh, learning all all the new rules like for example you you can turn right on the red lights here i didn't know that first uh so yeah <laughs> It's a couple of different things. I'm sure a few people let you know that you could turn red or turn right on red lights immediately. Yeah. yeah. Did you figure out the Michigan left yet? No. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it's. Uh, I don't think we'll be the right ones to even explain it to you. It's a. It's okay. a more complicated left hand turn. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, I need to. I need to get my Michigan driver license also. So I'm working on it. So Elmer, you uh, you have a the unique privilege of playing against your brother uh, in the NHL as well. He's obviously with the Chicago Blackhawks organization, splitting time between uh, Chicago and Rockford. Uh, playing against him, knowing that he's in the league, what was that first game 
uh, against him like. I remember you had a shot on goal that uh, actually led to a goal. I believe it, it generated a rebound that went in. Uh, what was yeah. that moment like for you? Uh, it's it's always real fun to to play against him. I uh, I played him two two times in the Swedish league. Uh, I didn't score on him, so I was really really pumped up to uh, to be able to score on him. But uh, yeah, an assist I was was okay, obviously. But uh, yeah, it's really fun to play against him and, and compete against him and just uh, yeah be on the same ice. It's it's real fun to have him to have him here also in the same league. Uh, going back to uh, uh, talking about your brother and playing against him, um, what's it like for your parents to be able to watch you you guys play in the NHL? And uh, just between you and your brother, do you do you give each other advice? Uh, is it like no contact at all uh, before a game? You don't want to get in each other's heads. What's that like? Uh, yeah, I think we we talk more after the games instead of uh, before the games. Uh, I think both of us wants to just uh, be able to focus on the game before and uh yeah then we talk a lot after the games and uh yeah of course we can give us uh some tips and tricks and advice to each other uh it's that's the benefit of having one goalie and one uh, one forward so we can give each other some tips so that's that's always good obviously everyone knows how tall you are um but that's not really, you don't mold your game around your height. Does it ever get sort of tiring or annoying for you to, you know, people always expecting that you're going to be this big, tough guy who's willing to drop the gloves. Like, does that kind of stuff get old to you? Because there's so much more to your game than just that. Yeah, I, I think I'm getting pretty used to hear that. So I don't, I don't mind it. You know, it's, uh, you have to like decide what, what, what things you're going to listen to and take take after and, and some things you're just gonna like don't care about that and play your game so uh yeah i'm used to hearing it and uh some things i i agree with and i need to to like play more physical and stuff like that but i, I think i still need to to play my own game and uh find find a good balance do you have any i know a lot of guys um you know if former Red Wings will reach out to, to prospects and young players to try and give them advice and help them with the transition to the, the NHL game. Has there been anybody in the Red Wings organization that that's reached out to you and someone that you've gravitated towards uh, just to, just to help you out? Yeah. Um, Nick Cronwall was, uh, was helping like all the, all the Red Wings prospect back in Sweden. Uh, even last year he was, uh, was, was really helpful. And, uh, gave us a lot of tips and tricks and even went out on ice with us. So, uh, yeah, I think that was, was huge for us and, uh, be able to already then kind of see, see what we need to improve to be able to, to take the next step. Elmer, the, the Red Wings have had three straight, uh, first round picks, uh, the first of the first round picks come out of the SHL with Marco Casper, Simon Edvinson, and Lucas Raymond. Uh, and then if you go one year further back, Mo Sider obviously ended up playing in the SHL for a little bit. Uh, from your perspective, what has changed in terms of the world's perception of, of the uh, SHL as an elite league? And uh, do you think there's even more untapped potential there in terms of prospects coming through uh, to be NHL ready? Uh, yeah, I think... Uh... SHL is a really good league. It's a tough league to play in, and uh, I think it's it's a it's a good place to be in for a young guy, you know, learning learning to play that game. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't know what to say about it, but I think you have to watch it to be able to to understand what it's about. Uh, but uh, yeah, from my perspective, it's a it's a really good and tough league, and I think it's going to be a lot of good prospect there coming up. All right, and, and just to wrap up here, obviously you're with the Griffins now. Grand Rapids has an incredible fan base, so uh, no doubt that those games are fun to play in. What's your goal for the rest of the season? Uh, just kind of improve your game as much as you can in, the, in Grand Rapids, or are you hoping to be back in the winged wheel before the end of the year? Yeah, of course. I I, uh, I hope to be back uh, as soon as possible. That's the, the the main goal. But at the same time, I... I, I uh, I think I need to improve my game and I can do that here a lot. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to play my, my best game and, uh, yeah, see what happens and take it from there. 
All right, Elmer. Well, hopefully the next time uh, we have you on the show, uh, there are a lot more kind of Red Wings goals and highlights to talk about uh, as your career progresses. We're excited to to watch your game grow. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time, folks. This has been Elmer Soderblom. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Okay, before we get into the next topic, I want to let everyone know that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by NordVPN. Are you missing out on a game or your favorite show because it's not available in your region? Let me introduce NordVPN. Using NordVPN and a click of a button, you can watch and browse as if you're elsewhere in the world, making sure you never miss a game and can watch whatever content you'd like. No need to travel across the continent or oceans for your favorite team when NordVPN brings them right to you. With over 5,000 server options, no game or show is out of your reach. Using our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, you can receive a huge discount on NordVPN's cybersecurity two-year plan, plus four free months. We all love to binge, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted, so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, there's literally no risk to you at all with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire thing never even happened. Check out our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, to get your discounted subscription started today. Again, big thanks to Elmer, uh, the Red Wings, and the Griffins uh, for uh, for having Elmer on the show. That was a really great time. And uh, after we finished recording, Evan and I were chatting with Elmer a bit more, and we did explain what the Michigan left was. We did our best to uh, try not to scare him off either. I know he likes the traffic back in, in Sweden a little bit more than what he's seen here uh, in North America. But unfortunately, that part's not going to change. No, not at all. Okay. Uh, some news from across the NHL related to the trade deadline. Uh, Bo Horvat. The interest from the Red Wings continues to be documented uh, and is pretty genuine at this point it's it's obvious to say uh not even just hearing it from us on the show a lot of other um you know sources are popping up uh including detroit's name in the list of potential teams so we know there's at least some interest from eisman on bo horvat uh let me walk us through a timeline here and this is going to be colored a little bit by my opinion and let me know what you think last offseason Actually, let's go before last offseason. Last season, Eisman watched the Red Wings get caved in a bad way, like losing to the tune of 8, 9, 10, 11 goals, whatever. Uh, he knew it wasn't sustainable. He knew butts weren't going to be in seats if they lost that kind of way. He knew that was bad for Larkin, Sider, Raymond, etc. So he knew he wanted to make the team better. Cut to last offseason. He goes out and he adds Perron, Chirot, Kopp. He brings in Vili Husso. He, he signs Dominic Kublik. It was a, the biggest flurry of free agent signings that we've seen really since we started covering this team. Uh, July 1st passes, or, or the, the date where Dylan Larkin's uh, no trade clause kicks in passes, and uh, Eisenman realizes that he has no, or he loses a big piece of leverage now. Because I or Larkin didn't sign an extension before that trade deadline, or that uh, that trade protection kicked in, he knows he is now at risk of losing Larkin technically for nothing. Could happen. Eisman sees Bo Horvat is going to be available. It's becoming a little bit more likely uh, every day that Bo Horvat's not going to sign with um, Vancouver. Bo Horvat grew up a Red Wings fan. There's obviously, not that that always marries a player to their hometown team, but there's always some kind of residual interest for that. There's a lot of talk about Bo, Bo Horvat in general, just wanting to be back on the East Coast. So you start to look at who could potentially replace Larkin, or let's even look at it this way, who could uh, add to Larkin in the ter- in terms of top six centers. Come trade deadline, or where we are now, Larkin is still not signed. Steve Eisenman says, okay, if I lose Larkin, I need to bring in someone else. Otherwise, everything I did over last offseason was a mistake. Or... I keep Larkin and I bring in Bo Horvat. Bo Horvat's number is more is lower than Larkin's, so I can point to that and say, "Hey, Dylan, why should I give you you know nine point two five if Bo's signing for eight? So it serves the purpose of making the team better and bringing the number down for Dylan Larkin. How off base am I here? 
I don't think it has that much to do with the negotiation with Larkin in terms of the number. I think it's very relevant to the Larkin negotiation because it's a safety net. I mean, if I, because we've, and I know I have sat here and said, Eisenman hit the gas this offseason. If he loses Larkin for nothing, it was all for naught because it would, would have been the wrong thing to do. If you walk away from this season with no Dylan Larkin but a Bo Horvat, maybe it's a wash. I think Larkin's probably a bit better of an overall player than Horvat. Horvat a bit better offensively, at least in the goal scoring department. So, you know, we we could have that argument, but that's not worth having right now. And I get the logic from Eiserman on that, if that is indeed the case. The only thing is I, I tend to think the opposite. I think you should walk away with this with both or none. Because if you don't have Larkin, you know, through the rebuild and, and you're not finding – and this is all under the assumption a lot of other things don't happen. You don't get a Timo Meyer, You don't get a David Pasternak. You don't get a Bo Horvat. You strike out on everybody else. So this team is essentially right where they are next year as they are right now, which, as we've stated before, really can't happen one way or the other. This team either needs to retool around the younger core or go all in. Like, yeah. go after Horvath, go over Pasternak, whatever the answer might be. And again, I don't have these answers. That's why I'm not an NHL GM. But this all kind of serves to what I think all Eisenman's ultimate plan is. And it's a conversation we've been having for years on this podcast where we have said, can you win a Stanley Cup with Dylan Larkin as your number one center? And the general answer is no. Unless you have two Dylan Larkins. And Bo Horvat's in and around that Dylan Larkin tier. So if you have a 1A, 1B center and it's Horvat and Larkin, can you win a Stanley Cup with that? Yes. It's with trying to not uh, give you another edit here, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of ifs and buts that go around with that. Yeah. Um, you need elite wingers. You need elite defense because you will not have the, you know, prototypical centerman that gets you a Stanley Cup. But if you are elite at other positions and you are very, very strong and deep at center, which between Larkin, Horvat, and Casper should be the case, it can be done. Now, this is arguably the biggest turning point in Eiserman's tenure uh, because he hit the gas. It didn't go as planned fully. And now he's at the risk of actually going backwards through no fault of his own, because if Larkin walks, Larkin walks. But that's a huge step back. So if the outcome here is we lose Larkin but get Horvat, that's a net loss. If the result here is we lose Larkin but we get Horvat at the trade deadline and give up a first-round pick and a top prospect to do it, that's a huge net negative. If the result here is we get Bo Horvat and Dylan Larkin and another free agent in the offseason of significance, that's a huge win. But there really can't be an in-between here. Otherwise, we're just spinning our tires. You got a full asset. Yeah, can't half-ass anything here. And losing Larkin and replacing with Horvat is almost the definition of half-assing it. So you couldn't, you wouldn't feel comfortable or you think it would be less desirable uh to deal assets at all if it meant keeping Larkin and getting Horvat. Oh no, I if we're keeping Larkin, yeah. And we're giving up a first like let's say our 2024 first and I don't know, pick a prospect, Albert Johansson for Bo Horvat, I would do that. I don't love giving up a first round pick where the Red Wings are at in the rebuild. I think they need those darts on the board for all the talent issues we've addressed. But Bo Horvat is, in all likelihood, going to outperform a mid-first-round pick. That's just the reality. But he himself is a ninth overall pick and has probably outperformed his draft slot. You're only going to get eight years of it versus an entire career, and you're going to get the back half of it, which isn't ideal, but salary cap going up, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not even worrying about that right now because, again, I'm the guy banging the table going, holy shit, this team needs high-end talented players. If as high-end as you can get is Bo Horvat and you got to give up significant assets to do it, you have to do it. Like, unfortunately, as much as I wouldn't love the the idea of that trade, you can't not. This team is yeah. way too far down the rabbit hole to not invest in high-end players. If this offseason is we give up multiple first-round picks and 
a couple of our top prospects because we get Timo Meyer and Bo Horvat, and then we go throw $12 million at David Pasternak. Good. Do it. Like, something has to be done. You can't get stuck in the murky middle, which the Red Wings right now are in a great risk of doing. Yeah. So there, I know there's a uh, there's a really strong argument from folks saying, okay, so ignoring whether or not we believe Horvat would be the right answer for the Red Wings, and I think you laid out a lot of reasons how it could work, Brad. Uh, but ignoring all that, why would Detroit give up assets to get Horvat at the trade deadline if they know he has interest in coming to Detroit? And there's a couple things to remember here. Remember how Detroit got Vili Husso? They gave up a third round pick just for the rights to sign him and then signed him. Multiple teams were pissed off. Toronto was pursuing him. Like sometimes you have to give something up to get for to go first in line. Like that's not just the draft where that's the case. Um, Bo Horvat, I'm sure, would like to play in Detroit. That that part's it's uh, not really hard to assume. But we don't know that he only wants to play in Detroit, right? We've not heard any indication that he's uh, exclusively wants to play in Detroit and will only come here in free agency. If he goes to free agency, there's other teams who maybe have GMs who are less sticklers or, or less responsible with their cap and will throw you know, $9.5 million at him. That changes things. I have uh, We had a little bit of an indication that Andrew Kopp wanted to come to Detroit, and it was kind of an open secret that he was going to market – uh, in free agency, and D- Detroit would have first picks at him as long as they met his price. And they did, and they got him. I don't know that that necessarily applies to Horvat, and I think there's going to be more emphatic of a chase for Horvat to get him. And that's going to start at the trade deadline, and, and if Vancouver doesn't deal him, which they'd be, even if they deal him to a team that doesn't extend him, he's going to have a lot of suitors at um, at free agency. So, that's still a, it's still a risk that Eisman could take. That's not an option here, right? You let him walk to free agency, and then maybe you get him there. Obviously, not giving up a first round pick or prospects or Philip Peronik or whatever the trade package would be for Horvat is ideal. What you're giving up if you make that trade is certainty, because Eisman's not making that deal without an extension. We know that. No, but there's a caveat that at least in um, in, in public reports, Canucks haven't given Horvat permission to to negotiate with teams yet. Now. Are there conversations happening behind the scenes? Hey, if any one of your clients, and I I love the way Jeff Merrick phrased it, had any interest in going to a city that's known for their car manufacturing facilities, uh, (laughs) would he be inclined to that? And and roughly, you know, what would his compensation need to be to move to such a city? Well, Harvard's like, wow, I'm going to play in Windsor, Ontario for the Spitz. That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) To, to say that any NHL GM interested in Bo Horvat right now doesn't have at least an idea of what he's looking for there <laughs> it is pretty naive. Yeah. Officially, no, tampering wouldn't happen. Of course yeah. not. My concern in the whole Bo Horvat, Timo Meyer situation is those are the names that have essentially been on the board the whole year, a la the, the Ben Sherratt. And Ben Sherratt got a, a king's ransom. So I I can only imagine the number of teams lining up for the, both those players is going to be everybody, and it's going to be who brings the biggest Brinks truck and backs it up. Well, the, the unique situation in this particular instance that doesn't scare me as normally this would, and this is going to sound like it's a joke, but it's quite literally not is how bad the Canucks management is at their jobs and the fact that they've publicly stated what they are looking for and the types of players they are looking for. And they almost could have handpicked the name Philip Pronick and Philip Zadina with what they were describing. I don't think the cost to hit Bo Horvat would be all that significant. I, like, it would be significant, but in terms of importance to the Red Wings' future, because... Again, for reasons we've laid out, I think first-round picks are the Red Wings' most valuable asset outside of, like, Casper, Edmondson, Sider, Raymond, just because they need those swings for high-end talent. If you can get Bo Horvat where the main piece is Philip Ronick, oh, my God, you have to do that. And I love Philip Ronick, and I think he could be a key piece to this team going forward. But you are going to have a much easier time replacing uh, a hypothetical Philip Peronik versus a hypothetical Bo Horvat. Right, the roles they play, the positions they play, their overall talent level. Um, so yeah, I, I think the Red Wings are in a position where not only could they overpay for Bor Horvat in quotations, but they have almost literally exactly what Rutherford laid out that the Canucks 
are looking for. Like, and he laid it out publicly. They're looking for right shot D. They're looking for fresh out of ELC reclamation products. Hey, Phillips Dina did did crap in Detroit, but we can fix him. This is what he laid out. So I'm not saying that's what's going to get it done. You get into bidding wars if Boston's like, hey, we'll give you those players plus a first round pick, plus a tie. We get how it goes. But if we can wait till free agency, I'd prefer that. But if the cost of getting him is uh, Zadina, Hronik, and a really good prospect with an extension. Winning is addictive, yeah. too. Like, if he goes to a, a contender of team that has success in the playoffs. Oh, God. The chances of Emery signing there are drastically higher than signing somewhere else. Because guys, those guys are the ultimate competitors. They are addicted to winning. There's something about a Stanley Cup that gets guys uh, to really buy in and that's going to be a very obvious statement but it's not it's happened before where a guy wins a cup with a team and then he sticks with them forever after and for generous contracts yeah um yeah like you can min max all day and say well the best scenario would, would be where detroit doesn't give up any of their assets and gets all the good players and that sometimes does happen sometimes you are able to get like you know uh, wait things out. Uh, I'm happy they didn't give anything up for Andrew Kopp and they just got him for, well, not for free. They signed him to a significant contract in the offseason. Uh, but, you know, think about the expectations on Kopp this season if they also gave up a second and something for him. It, it's a lot different. Uh, you you can always say things could have been better, but in the real world, if you want to make a move, going back to what you said, Brad, eventually you have to do something. It means you got to give stuff up. All the best teams who who give themselves a fighting chance to not just be in the playoffs, but be competitors. They pay the price. They take the risk and the risk comes with the assets they gave up. Sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes they make three straight Stanley cup finals. And sometimes they beat the twice reigning Stanley cup champions. Like they're, you have to make those moves and not that Horvat is going to get Detroit into that conversation. But yeah, Brad, if, if you are going to not half ass what you did last summer, you have to, push your foot down on the gas even harder or completely slam on the brakes. I, I don't think people are aware of how close this team is to, I'm not going to say starting, but like prolonging the rebuild. Cause if they don't get Horvat, if the Bruins resign Pasternak and the Red Wings don't get to the table, if someone else trades for Meyer, if Larkin doesn't resign, you are now at the point you are selling Perron and Kubelik and whatever you can because you have no core older than the Cider Raymond bracket. So you might as well build around that bracket. And would that delay put them in a rebuild for another two, three years? Almost certainly. But and it's not even that I or you or Iserman want that. It's because if they completely strike out on everybody this year, including Larkin. You don't have a choice. You do not have a foundation to get good immediately. That is just the reality of it. They don't have the depth of talent. They don't have the high-end talent. But all of a sudden, the alternative, if all of a sudden you have two top two centers and legit top two centers and you have a Marco Casper coming and let's hope Simon Edmondson pans out. Okay, now there's a conversation. Yeah, the core is going to be built around the young guys, but we have our veteran centers who are going to be the drivers of this team until their legs can no longer do it and coming out of a flat cap there's a path to see that happening would paying uh, pulling numbers into my ass here 17 and a half mil for larkin and horvat be too much for what they bring probably well, Austin matthews might get that himself yeah. very soon but yeah probably now yeah that's too much but in three years is it egregious no and at least with Bo, Bo Horvat at eight and Larkin at 8.875, very livable. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if you have to slightly overpay to secure it, sure. Um, again, not ideal. I'm not saying in a perfect world, this is how the blueprint should look, but it is doable. But I, I can't stress enough. You need to be all in or not at all. There's, if you walk away from this off season with one of them, and you go into next season with very minimal changes on the roster around them. Congratulations. We are now the Minnesota Wild for 15 years. Like it, you have to be super, super careful to not get caught reaching for straws that aren't there. The other, you know, 
looking outside of Detroit is look at the division. Like who are they going to like Florida might be a real dropper, but that's no guarantee. Um, Boston might drop off over the next few years, but we thought again, that for five years is not, we, happening. we've been saying that since the start. And like, I don't even believe it when I say it. So it's, it's, it's like, they might know, be okay, having the so best we, season in NHL history. And, yeah. if, and if Bo Horvat doesn't go to the Red Wings, who's the front runner to land Boston. him right now? Boston. So what I'm saying is even if Detroit gets Bo Horvat and like, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, like take a look around the room. Like every other team in your division has better than both of those centers plus elite wingers and mostly excellent goaltending. Like just because you solve two pro I mean, you're solving two big problems, but it's a long road. ahead. It's, it's a, still a very long road, but that's, you know, you can find elite wingers much more easily than you can elite centermen. I also think, um, there is not enough said, and that's because we've watched him. He's played so many games already he played 82 last year, you know, you, we've seen him go through the throes of a sophomore season. I think Lucas Raymond's head headroom is so high. Like I For think sure. I think he's going to be such a good prominent star winger in this league, or he has all the tools and ability to be. And we've seen that from him, and that just goes to show up. And like it's not even just that they're easier to acquire. The Red Wings have a a better head start on that. Like okay, what's what goes on if Casper doesn't stick at center? He's still an option to be a top six winger on the Red Wings. Uh, there's. Yeah, solving the two center options is, it's almost cruel because it's necessary. You need to have those two positions locked down on, on the first and second lines, but you can't assume that it's done after that. There's a long way to go. Look at Buffalo. They're the fighting for could, a playoff spot. The Red Wings can improve five points next year with Bo Horvat, and I wouldn't even be that surprised. That would be it. Yeah. Just because every other team in the division is so loaded, and the teams like Buffalo are taking – a huge step just because all their prospects are hitting right now. Okay. So you both laid out, I think very realistic and, and they're necessary points. We, there was a message in the discord that like, it was a little bit, you know, harrowing uh, when we started to talk about what might be coming or, or, you know, what the Red Wings are facing right now, but it, it's necessary to talk about. I'm going to offer my opinion, which I will qualify by saying I, it might be a little too high in the sky. I recognize the concerns. I echo them. But I myself am still not concerned because there's so much that has to happen between now and July. You're not concerned about what? Like the Red Wings settling in that mucky middle. Because it, it, No, yeah, I, I'm not concerned about it yet because we don't know what's going to happen. I'm just saying this is that's exactly what between now and July they need to avoid. And I think there's there's two things that really cannot be overstated in terms of how much they've affected this season. Tyler Bertuzzi, Jacob Vrana. Plain and simple, those were supposed to be two of your most, at worst, your third and fourth most productive forwards, elevating your first and second most productive forwards. And that is worst case scenario. Verano was supposed to be your elite scorer. Bertuzzi was supposed to be a high producer who was going to be the bell of the ball at the trade deadline. And both of those guys, for very different but you know very uh, impactful reasons, have not been in the lineup this year. That, like... Eisenman hitting the gas, people are looking back in retrospect. They're saying, oh, you know, I can't even fathom why he did that. And it was certainly was a decision. It wasn't the only choice. He could have, you know, said, hey, Connor Bedard is going to be first overall this next draft. I want that. He went in the opposite direction. But it's a lot more easy to understand when you have those two guys in your lineup, at least somewhat more than they have been this season, and producing. So the Red Wings have been hurt in so many ways in terms of their production, which has been you, uh, arguably the worst part of their, or the most efficient part of their game where you're like, we know they can do better than this because they've been missing those two guys. And that has thrown a massive wrench in, in I think the perception of this season. And I'm sure Eisenman's plans this season. Uh, and you might say, okay, well, what does winning this season mean in, in the long run? Sure. Yeah, whatever. They probably wouldn't be a playoff team anyways, or, they could be, you know, keeping it competitive up until now before falling out in like March. It's more that those are two massive trade pieces potentially you take off the table at the deadline. Those are two you you can either keep them as cores uh, as part of your core for the future, or you flip them into premium assets to to shift the uh, the the competitive core back to the Cider Raymond group exclusively. Losing one is one thing; losing both was a the biggest wrench in Detroit season. 
All you did was make me worry more with that statement because you're objectively right, but came to a different conclusion. Because I agree with you fully. If we had 30 goal scorer Jacob Run and 30 goal scorer Tyler Batuzzi in this lineup for the whole year, and we had the the best versions of them that we've seen, oh my God, yeah, this team's night and day better. I don't think they're a playoff team, but they are not as far to the conversation as they are now. They'd be right in the mix with Buffalo and Pittsburgh and whoever. I, I fully believe it. But we didn't have them, and we saw how big that goal scoring hole is without them. And I think we can probably safely assume we're not getting them next year either. So guess what? That's two gigantic holes you still need to fill that Bo Horvat doesn't do because he doesn't play their position. I Michael Scotted that a bit, didn't I? Just, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. But I'm I'm just like I think there's a uh there's a tendency to look at the position Detroit's in now and the concern is fair. And I think a better way of articulating what I was trying to land on was People might say, how did Detroit get to this spot? Like, was it just mistake after mistake after mistake to get to the spot? And what I'm trying to say is not necessarily. No, like, I, I don't think that's the case. I think this is a confluence of a lot of, I mean, Eisenman put the team, like he took a risk by by hitting the gas pedal in the offseason and signing those UFAs uh, because you put yourself at risk for a situation like this, of course. But it was also, holy shit, horrendous luck. Horrendous luck to get to this point. The Red Wings really have had just about everything go against them in in the rebuild no draft lotteries tons of injuries guys who you expect to trade for a ton just get hurt or underperform or etc like how many guys that were on the trade block actually had a good year the year they were traded that didn't regress like it hasn't happened i'm i I am exhausted by knowing who detroit's trade pieces are going to be like months in advance just because it's a cosmic guarantee that they're going to get hurt the the one who underperformed the least and still got a decent return was athanasiu yeah and that's because ken holland just likes the things that he knows yeah and man that's why eisenman traded mantha when he did he didn't even give him the chance i was the per- it was perfect <laughs> don't worry about the results of that trade but it was perfect and what I want actually want to close this this piece out by saying is, yeah, I just explained all these things where it's like Eisenman can't have controlled what happened to Verona or, or Bertuzzi or whatever. Uh, a lot of bad luck. And, of course, he took his risk. But this is the job of a GM. Like, this is what Eisenman has signed up to do. So this isn't a, you know, absolve Red Wings management of all. If something bad happens, like, you can't blame them. No, like, it's his job to get out of this now. What Brad said before, I don't refute that. Like, Detroit has to pick a path. This is yet another fork in the road, and if they just, as Evan said, half-ass it, you land in a very, very, very dangerous spot. And they might not even get to pick which road they go down because if Boston, oh, yeah. if Boston undercut like uh, outbids them for Horvat, and Larkin chooses not to re-sign, there, there's what's that old uh, saying from Star Trek? It is possible to do nothing wrong and still lose. And is that, that Star is, Trek? Is it Star Trek? I don't know. I'm not going to look it up. I'm going to make you guys try to figure it out. I I can't be asked to look myself, so I'm not going to. <laughs> it's something I heard in passing like a year ago, so I'm just going to. Did I'm you just watch Star Trek a year ago? <laughs> no, it was like I think it was like a Instagram reel or a TikTok clip or something like that. I don't I don't know. I don't care. I'm not that invested enough. But the saying stands true. Eisman could do everything right with Horvat and Larkin here and still end up with neither of them. Devastating news, Evan. I looked it up and he was right. Wow. Yeah. Old like. Original Star Trek? Oh, like, how much detail do you want, man? Oh, I don't know. I'm just trying to remember it was, who said it. It was, it. It was Picard. Man. Yeah, it was Picard. Okay. Anyways, um, so that's always there. And while you were talking, though, there's one thing that kind of a, a trade with Vancouver that has nothing to do with Horvat that actually would make a lot of sense to me. Tell me Kuzmenko. No. Ah, okay. He's a pending UFA. No. I'm a glutton for punishment. You know change of scenery trades like this guy just isn't working out here but the talent is obvious and you the know silly pod colds in? and there's contract situations where guys are overpaid and maybe they each have two years left on it is there something centered around Verona for Besser that could make sense here both teams are done with those guys and they both have two years left at probably too much money if Vancouver wants oh maybe you a this is like a we're dealing in the land of misfit toys here. Like these could be like the throw-ins in the Horvat trade. Oh, by the way, let's just swap these guys and see what happens. We'll need three hours for that episode if it also includes Besser and Verona. Like we'll need uh, Persson's calculator running in overdrive. We'll have to buy more RAM. Yeah, I don't know if I I just I have done 
zero research, put zero thought in that. But like, Welcome I just remembered the their contract, <laughs> their contract, their talent, and their situations, and went, that, yeah, there could be something there. You know, you mentioned before we started recording the other day, actually, you mentioned Besser, and and it seemed, I don't know, uh, it seemed naive, or not naive, it seemed like, why would we earlier in the season when we didn't know Bertuzzi and Verano would be out that long? But if you are actually going down the, the, the road that's, no, no, you get better, and even if it's not a home run swing, every time you take a single, you take a double, and it's not going to be pretty, but you get better... Besser could make sense. We're going to moneyball this bitch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By taking on terrible contracts. <laughs> well, and despite Rutherford saying just about everything else publicly, he hasn't said it publicly, but there's been reports that Vancouver might just eat it on Besser and like give up something to unload his contract. If you take Besser with Horvat, does that lower the asking price on Horvat? Does it increase the asking price? Is it a throw in? I. I won't I won't predict what Vancouver management is thinking because I don't know if anyone knows. I don't if, know if they know. Yeah. So it's how to keep your enemies guessing. That's right, Art of War, baby. Okay, actual final point here, and I, I didn't get it in my entire brain dump of information earlier. Uh another reason why I think um you know Eisenman might be keen on Horvat here is uh, again, as I was alluding to, no one would ever tamper. But GM seemed to have a really, really keen sense that, you know, almost pinpoint accuracy as to what a player would want in terms of dollar value. Um, if Eisenman is is standing uh, pat based on Larkin at, you know, 9, 9.25, 9.5, his ask is in that range. Well, he wouldn't chase Horvat if Horvat's ask was also in the same range. It doesn't matter if you like Horvat better as a player. You can't think he's that much better. I think Brad was right. He's in the same tier as Larkin. Uh, so I think Horvat's ask based on my understanding, is what Eisenman would consider more reasonable. So you can glean a little bit about the dollar value that might come in there based on that. All right. That is a uh, that is a dense episode full of uh, a great Elmer Soderblom interview, uh, full of a great conversation about Bo Horvat in the trade deadline. Um, lots, lots, lots to come. The forks on the road aren't going to stop between now and March 3rd and then even beyond that when inevitably, of course, Detroit is going to win the uh, the draft lottery, right? We only need to do one prospect profile. I think so, yeah. Okay, we can stop there. That's right. We don't have to do uh, any more research. Okay. So with that all said, I'm going to bring us to overtime, uh, our segment where we answer fan questions, comments, uh, and rude remarks. Uh, and answer them as best we can. Overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Uh, Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast to support the show. Uh, The reason this show happens is because of our patrons. We would not be here without them. Uh, We would not have ever interviewed Elmer Soderblom without them. We wouldn't be running Winged Wheel Podcast nights or days without them. So uh, big thank you to all of them. Uh, Benefits for being a Winged Wheel Podcast patron, you get access to the official WWP Discord, which is a great... Uh, community. There are even Evan sightings in there. Uh, you get access to the uh, overtime uh, bonus episodes, which record right after these ones or, or right after the main show. Uh, there are a couple that are uh, backlogged that will be uploaded soon. So apologies for the delay. Blame the person who does production on this show. Me. Um, and you also get entered into all of our giveaways. So any giveaway that we do, you're automatically entered. We are giving away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings uh, home game this season, primarily those will be going to Winged Wheel Podcast patrons. So again, patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, I too am a virtual all-star, says besides Larkin, can you each name one, a player that is part of the trade rumors that's a must-have on this team next year, and two, uh, a player whose value is worth greater in assets than being on this roster? Dylan Larkin. Not Larkin. <laughs> Dylan Larkin. <laughs> Um, like a player whose value to this team is better than in the trade rumors. How far, like in the serious trade rumors, are we going? Because it's there's that list isn't very long. If there is a run on defensemen like there was last year, it pains me to say because I think he could be an answer in either one of those categories. But Philip Perona could be in either one of those categories. I've seen his name mentioned briefly, but I don't think he's super into the trade rumors. But keep Jake Wallman. Yep. Do not trade Jake Wallman. Keep Jake Wallman. Um, and who you have to trade. 
Bertuzzi because I don't see his value going up. I think they can still get reputation value here. Joseph Barry, this is going to be a good one, says, do you guys think the NHL should have done a soft cap with a luxury tax instead of a hard cap? No. I'm a firm no on that one. I get the sentiment behind it, but I don't want this to turn into the MLB. I I really don't. I just Every year, you know the Dodgers are going deep in the playoffs. You just... The Yankees are always going to be one of the better teams. Why? Because they can outspend everybody. Nobody wants to admit it, but the hard cap really does truly bring in parity. Now, it brings in cyclical parity, which people seem to uh, misunderstand. Not every team is going to be good every year, but every team has the opportunity to be good. They can enter the rebuild or come out of it whenever the hell they want, and that's up to competent management to determine. But it really does bring a balanced playing field. I agree, and I will also say if you look at the the loudest proponents of me <laughs> getting rid of the hard cap, yeah, it's the rich. Um, it's a lot of Toronto or big market based voices, or it is agents and players, which makes sense because it is financially beneficial for them to not have a hard cap. That makes sense, and I don't begrudge them for that. That's their job. Uh, and if you're a fan in like Toronto, where you know you or Philly even where you know your ownership group can spend a kajillion dollars on players, yeah, you're going to want a soft cap. You yeah, have... so they can buy guys like Rasmus Ristolainen. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not besmirching the good name of Risto, who just because he fails goal. just because he fails the analytics test and the eye test and the <laughs> vibes test does not make him a bad player. He gets right? a monster contract. <laughs> Riddle me that. I don't know if it needs to be so black and white in terms of yes, hard cap, yes, no cap, or no salary cap i think there's something in between like i think i've mentioned it before like a designated player each team gets two or three and like then you're rewarded for drafting properly and developing properly and you can just get elite talent when you need it i am much more in favor of something like that rather than changing the cap system where a rich owner can buy if, because it's not fair that a team drafts well and develops well. Oh, we've got six guys who should be making ten million bucks, but we got to get rid of two of them. Like that's yeah. where's the incentive for that? Yeah, and it, let's not forget. Like I think it's easy to forget how low the lows were in terms of NHL ownership and spending before the salary cap came into play. You had teams revenue is going up year over year. There's no reason why they can't do something like that. There's a lot. Yeah, there's room there. Um, Keenan O'Donohue says, Hey fellows, it's been a minute since I asked a question. This one's for Brad as we're both draft enthusiasts, assuming the Red Wings finish 11 to 14 out of these choices, which do you like the most? Ryan Leonard, Callum Ritchie, Andrew Cristal, uh, Oliver Moore and Riley height. Oliver Moore comfortably. Yeah. Yeah. E emphatically Oliver Moore out of that particular list. Okay. Uh, Large Thorzell, and it's only appropriate that we take this question today, says, Greetings, Sweetophiles. Now that you have undoubtedly peaked with having the towering behemoth on as a guest, what will you do next? On the idea, oh, what will we do next? I don't know. Maybe Evan will uh, will invite us over to the hot tub now. No. Oh, well, it's worth a shot. Just know when the cordyceps gets me, I'm coming for you first. I don't know what that word is. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people listening will <laughs> okay. will get it. Uh, on the idea of a Horvat trade, would you agree to take Oliver Ekman Larson and his deal to buy him out to make the Horvat deal cheaper? God, no, no, no. That contract is that that contract is a cap destroyer. If OEL is coming back, I want it to be part of a mega package for like Quinn Hughes or something. Even then, yeah. How many more years is left on that? <laughs> like five or is something. It is it really that bad? He is. That was such a bad trade. To I make. didn't understand that trade at the time. At the time, but I didn't. I, I knew it was longer than the end of this year. Oh, only four more seasons after. Oh this one. my god! Only. <laughs> and uh, he was healthy scratch two weeks ago too. Just for reference. Oh, Cody says uh, greetings, gents. If you could press a button that can make the Red Wings three peat uh, winning Stanley Cup. Winning the Stanley Cup, but then miss the playoffs for 25 years straight. Are you pressing it? Love the content and keep doing what you do. Well, we're a fifth of the way there right now, yeah. so I'll say yes. <laughs> yes, I, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It would, you know, it would hard to be like to know that fact in this hypothetical uh, universe where you control the will of the hockey gods. But uh, yeah, you still do it. 
You have to. 32. There's teams who would do that right now. There's teams who would do that for one cup. Yeah. 32 teams in the league. You say this a lot, Brad. If you win once every 32 years, you're doing as expected. So if you live to the age of 75 and you see your team win three cups, you have beat the odds. Yeah. Uh, Ari Fragan says, what's up, guys? Just have a few questions about our beloved Carter Mazer. He's having a great season with Denver and is definitely in the Hobie Baker conversation. Is he a guy we can expect to be with the big boys in Detroit in a season or two? And if slash when he does, is it realistic for him to be in the top six? Cheers, fellas. Next year, I'd say unlikely. Year after that, possible. Is he a lock for the top six? No, but he's making a really damn good case for it. I think, I don't know that I'd call him unlikely next season. I think he'd have a fighting chance. I think he has... A fighting chance, yeah. Which is kind of the definition of unlikely. I can't imagine him (laughs) coming in and starting in the top six. I don't think top six next year, but I could see him making it really interesting uh, in camp. Like, Is a coin flip too optimistic? Yes. Yeah. Call me an optimist then. (laughs) I'm Carter Mazur's biggest fan. Depends how many players the Red Wings trade or let walk in free agency too because they have a billion forwards right now uh John Engels says hey guys I finally got to listen to the latest gear talk episode uh you guys are talking about how NHLers NHLers will repaint their stick as a different model so my question for you is why do they do that um it's generally very little to do with the player most of the time and more what the company sponsoring them wants to advertise did you hear uh Brad Marchand spray painted his gloves at the Winter Classic yeah he didn't want to wear actual gold gloves because he was in the zone with his his pair of gloves he was wearing at the time. Find a picture of him wearing his gloves, like where you can see the palm. It looks like a beer leaguer's gloves. Like the palms, like there's holes and it's it's obscene. If it works, man. If it works, it works. Yeah. Uh, Irish Irish wristwatch switch swath says, "Hey, Winged Wheel Podcast crew, really enjoy the show. As someone who hasn't played hockey in any organized league, I have a quick strategy question." In the scenario where you're trying to hold on to a one-goal lead in the final 60 seconds of regulation, uh, why not roll with an extra D-man? Skate just one winger and roll two D-rotations instead of three for the extra defensive presence. My guess is that it's a matter of depth. Going that far down the roster for D-men isn't necessarily a better defensive play than a top-six winger. Skill is trumping the positional edge. Thanks a bunch. When you get into high levels, you have to understand how heavily and important teams rely on their systems and positioning. If you throw three defensemen out there, one of them is playing in a spot they are very not comfortable with. And that generally is not going to go well. They're going to read the play poorly. They're going to miss assignments. Things go wrong. Whereas if you have two wingers, a center and two D out there, they know where to be. They know what to do. They know what the system is. Um, So, You put a defenseman out there to play the right winger spot and all of a sudden the defenseman turns the wrong way and the strong side D steps past him and takes the middle of the ice. That's an A-plus scoring chance. So even the wingers aren't relied on defensively heavily, they can still get burned if they don't know what they're doing. I don't know if you guys know this, but when I played, I played defense. No, I didn't. Yeah. And uh, one time we were in a playoff game and there was a brawl, as there tends to be, um, and we were missing like a ton of forwards. And so pretty much... We were flush with defensemen, and we had to just cycle guys through to take shifts. That I, I think it was center or right wing, happened a couple of times, and I remember thinking, "Yeah, you take a few pointers from the the coach on the offensive side of the bench, and you know you do your best. You know you're not going to go out there and score three goals, but just be in the right place at the right time." And it was when the puck was in our own zone, and I was playing wing. I was like, "I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to be doing here. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea where I'm meant to be on this ice right now." And I was like. I was a good. I wasn't like a kid. Like I was a good hockey player, knew the game real well, and I was like, I know I would know where my winger's supposed to be if I was a defenseman. But now that as a winger, yeah, no earthly idea. And and your average fan really, truly has no idea or severely underestimates how complicated and how much you need to know on the ice. And react as it's happening. Because not only do teams have their systems that you have to know inside and out with timing, rhythm, that you also have to know the contingencies. If this happens, you do this. If this happens, you do Y. If this happens, you do X. The, the level at the NHL in which you have to know 
a billion different things about your position and exactly when and how to do it. Like on the camera, it just looks like they're all skating around, but at ice level within their own systems, it is staggering the amount you have to understand at one time. So yeah, circling back to the point, if you plop a defenseman who's never played wing out there to play wing, they're lost. You might as well have thrown them on a desert island because they are not going to know where to go. All right, folks, uh, we're going to wrap this up, and uh, we'll be back with you. Oh, God, we'll say Wednesday. I didn't know whether it was the weekend or the midweek episode. We'll be back with you on Sunday uh, for the next episode of the show, which will be after the next two Red Wings games and leading into the All-Star break. Uh, so thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors, NordVPN, uh, and thank you so much to all of our listeners, um, our name-level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Gron Foundation, Ake for Armchair GM slash Genius, Nick Perks, Terry Driver, the number 69, Cry and Ryan, Hannah's Banana Slam and Jamathong, Glenn Brabham, Aiden White, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, uh, Haywood, Haywood Jabuzoff. I had to check myself. You guys have been tricking me lately. Red Hot Ronick, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joseph Barry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Toad, King Toad, King Tone, Las Insuladas Picantes, Marcus, Matt McKay, Michael Edmund, Nedelkovich, goalie number one, Nicholas Fritz, RA, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Send It Seawolf, That's What I Appreciates About You, The Podcasting Couch, Venom, Zachary Rogers, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, uh, <laughs> uh, not reading that one. Antonio Gracias, Babe, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, uh, proud member of the Jake Wallman Gritty Club. Reed, you're getting clever with yours. Um, Brian Vasha, Brad Simmons, Carl Thames, Car- completely normal, not sleeping at all, cider. Uh, Connor Layton, Darren Fick, Philip Zidis Nuts, Grand, Rif- Grand Rapids Hockey Guy, Griffey Boy, Heronix Handlebar, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Lieutenant Matt S. of the Cheesebag Army, Linda Hull, Matt Keeler, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Ricky Bong Rips, Servo, Steven, who's a brand new name level sponsor. Welcome, Steven. The Hodag, thank you all so very much, and we'll talk to you Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.